Uh, there are things that don't always work, and these are things people talk about endlessly. Again, people who need a life. The rim sign. This indicates that there is hyperactivity or hypervascularity along the gallbladder, but you don't see activity within the gallbladder. What does this mean? I don't really know, and I don't quite care. I care whether or not I see the gallbladder, not the region around it. If you have common bile duct obstruction, are you going to see the gallbladder? Not necessarily. You may not see any bowel activity either. Very difficult to diagnose. You want to use sonography or an anatomic study to diagnose this. Many patients wait for the presence of bowel activity before injecting morphine sulfate based on the irrational fear that the common bile duct may explode if you give them a microscopic dose of morphine. Again, uh, this is repeated in every book between the 1960s and 2003. If you look at the references, there are none, but people continue to believe in this, so we let them. There is a concept of chronic cholecystitis. This means you don't have acute cholecystitis. You continue to have gallbladder pain, and we don't know why. If we whip out your gallbladder, you are miraculously cured. We call this chronic cholecystitis. Again, no clinical evidence, but we go along with that. And somebody has discovered that the gallbladder ejection fraction has to do with chronic cholecystitis, which means if it falls below a certain threshold level, then you're likely to have a dyskinetic or malfunctioning or diseased gallbladder. Remember, diseased gallbladder needs to come out because it can only stay around there and form gallstones. We don't know how exactly gallbladder ejection fraction can be measured. You can measure it using 3D CT. You can measure it using MR cholangiography. Um, we don't know exactly what the typical normal level of the gallbladder ejection fraction is. Is it 35%? Is it 30%? But yet people ask us to measure the gallbladder ejection fraction. And because of that, we do. Remember, gallbladder ejection fraction uh, ranges were set in the late 1970s. We have no idea what techniques they used at that time. We know that the normal range was between 35 and 42 percent. There are no studies comparing the types of food that were ingested. There are no studies comparing gender differences between men and women. There are no standardized control meals, so you've got to use something that is standardized for your patient population using your technique. Again, those studies where you had your 35 to 42% normal numbers were used with syncolide. Syncolide was not available back to us because of some production problems until around Christmas in 2002. Again, syncolide makes a, a, painful, a painless outpatient procedure an inpatient procedure necessitating observation, and it's not really an innocuous drug, so it makes things even more complicated. So we just give them a fatty meal. Remember, we need something that is a standard fatty meal. We used to have the standardized fatty meal, which was 65 grams of some yucky substance. Again, not very happy, these people, to begin with. And now we've got to ask them to go to the nearest you know, fast food, junk food place and, and get something that they really like, but we give them a specific prescription. You can't buy anything you want. You have to get this and this alone. Remember, anything above this red line is bad for you, but it's good for the test. I don't want you drinking milk with this. I don't want an orange juice. I don't want you to supersize it. I want you to have this specific meal because I need you to have 65 grams of fat. Unfortunately, I live in California. Somebody complained, so now we're down to eight ounces of Ensure Plus. So we had to decrease our threshold for gallbladder ejection fraction, but we've stuck with that. Everybody gets eight ounces of Ensure Plus. With that, our threshold is 35%. If your gallbladder ejection fraction is less than 35%, with 8 ounces of Ensure Plus, your gallbladder is whacked out. Gastric transit studies, you're doing this because you have gastrostasis or gastroparesis, typically because of diabetes or some neurogenic problem. You get a very specific meal. If it's a solid meal, you get one hard-boiled egg. There's no butter, there's no toast, there's no bacon. You just get one hard-boiled egg, and I'm going to see how quickly it goes through. If we're assessing liquid time, you drink one cup of orange juice through a straw. No glugging it down. You have to standardize your methods of intake, otherwise you can't use standard numbers. Of course, this has to bring people who have food allergies and dietary restrictions who are on the Atkins diet, so we can't really please everybody. So we have these alternatives. You can drink milk or soy juice or something like that. You've got to ingest it very quickly. This is not a spa. We're not going to wait around all day for you to finish your egg. 
So again, ingest it within 10 minutes, and then you keep getting image for the next 90 minutes. So this is a 100-minute examination while you're eating. And we want to evaluate using the cinematic protocol. So we want to see it on the monitor. You don't want to take static images. I want to assess dynamically how a food or fluid in the stomach is going to get emptied out. It does not make a difference whether you're standing, sitting, or supine when you're eating. Typically, you're sitting in the eating position, so that's what we like to do. We take anterior and posterior images and a left anterior oblique image. On the gastric transit study, we're going to analyze how quickly activity leaves the stomach. As soon as this is done, as soon as they've finished ingesting whatever was given to them, we give them a cup of water to wash it out so we don't have any contamination within the upper part of the esophagus. Uh, look at the transit time. There's a huge range in imaging. So almost always, if you have significant gastroparesis or gastric stasis, it's pretty obvious. The transit time is really just a number which doesn't mean very much. You want to image at least for a two-hour period. Typical imaging is 90 minutes after ingestion. Uh, lots of variability. Um, and again, the number doesn't mean anything. It's more of a qualitative analysis to see how much stays in the stomach. This is a very bizarre environment. You're sitting on a camera in front of a strange person and eating a hard-boiled egg. Not very happy. Esophageal reflux studies are done in the same way. We don't do esophagrams looking for reflux anymore. It's a waste of radiation, and it's not very sensitive. It's not very specific either. We give orange juice, and we wait to, to evaluate for residual esophageal activity. We increase pressure on the abdomen, and this is done in the supine position using an abdominal binder, and we look for spikes of activity. If we see more than three to five spikes of activity in children or in adults over the period of observation, then we know that there is significant esophageal reflux. So again, esophageal reflux is determined on the number of spikes of esophageal activity compared with background activity over a period of imaging, which is typically between 60 and 90 minutes. Intestinal imaging is typically done to look for aberrant gastric mucosa. Why are we doing this? We typically have a child who has a symptomatic mechal diverticulum. A mechal diverticulum is one that contains functioning hypertrophied gastric epithelium in an ectopic location. Because this is functional, it is bleeding. Because it is bleeding, the child is symptomatic. It's very quick to study this using pertechnotate. You may or may not pre-treat and post-treat these patients. I don't think it's necessary to make a simple outpatient procedure a complex and involved uh, inpatient procedures, so we don't pretreat these patients. Typically, you've got to be very specific about your criteria. Activity in the mechal diverticulum is because it's activity in ectopic functioning gastric epithelium. If you see activity in the right lower quadrant appearing at the same time as activity in the stomach, this indicates you have functional uh, gastric mucosa. Obviously, if the gastric mucosa there is ischemic, if it's necrotic, or there isn't significant gastric mucosa, you're going to get false negative areas. Again, appearing at the same time as the gastric mucosa, typically located in the right lower quadrant. GI blood loss studies are one of the few urgent blood, uh, nuclear medicine studies which are done overnight or on weekends or observed holidays. It's often a study that fills me with joy and delight because at the time of acquisition, the patient isn't really bleeding, or no one can remember when the patient last bled. That is completely useless. You have to be bleeding acutely at the time of image acquisition. If the nuclear medicine camera room does not smell of bloody stools, the study is going to be negative. So I can tell before I enter the room whether or not I'm going to see active GI blood loss. I don't need to look at the monitor. What are you going to detect? You're going to detect active ble bleeding. You do not detect occult bleeding using the study. Typically, these patients are hemodynamically unstable, so you want to do the study as quickly as possible. You want to image for at least a period of 90 minutes. If you see a focus of bleeding, you can stop immediately. Typically, those who are actively bleeding any large volume or a large speed of bleeding, there is a lot of active bleeding going on, you're typically going to see the focus of extravasation within 15 to 20 minutes. The yield after that is much lower. Delayed imaging for 18 to 24 hours is really not going to increase your sensitivity at all. 
Uh, some people like to bring back patients after 24 hours and re-image them without re-injection. Again, there is no evidence to support this. If you bleed again, I'm going to inject you again, and then I'm going to image. Again, uh, there are many other structures, because this is a blood pool study, that are seen in the lower abdomen and pelvis that may interfere with your uh, imaging. Uh, one of the things that people like to do is give these people heparin to encourage bleeding. I find that terribly scary. So the reason you are admitted to this hospital is because you're bleeding, okay. You're not bleeding anymore, and that's why I have a negative study. Terrific. Let me inject some heparin and make you bleed some more. Yes, I don't think so. The GI blood loss, again, you are going to see uh, transient areas of uh, increased activity if you have hypervascular lesions or inflammatory lesions. So while sensitive, it's not very specific. If you have large abdominal aortic aneurysms, you're also going to see pooling of activity. So you have to be very specific in your criteria. Not only should you see extravasation of autologous red blood cells, you must see increased accumulation over time, which means it's active extravasation. And in order to be sure that it's within the lumen of the small or large bowel, you should see it progress over time. Now, the peristalsis may be anti-grade or retrograde, but it's disordered peristalsis. So see increased activity, new foci of activity, activity increasing over time, and anti-grade or retrograde peristalsis. Unless you have all those criteria, you don't have active GI blood loss. Uh, we're not exactly sure when we should do angiography, endoscopy, and the GI blood loss studies. Uh, depending on who originates the paper, each one thinks they're superior to the other. And again, there are those lovely numbers depending on uh, determining the speed of bleeding, which shows uptake. Those speeds of bleeding studies are standardized for small farm animals, not for sick people in the ICU. Going on to the retroperitoneum, a few areas over here that we can help, the kidney, the bladder, and scrotal perfusion. In the kidney, we can assess function of the kidney, typically using serum chemistry. The obstructed kidney is best studied using a sonogram. If you want to look for renal hypertension, you use an MR angiogram. There are various ways of studying renal allograft dysfunction. So what is the role of nuclear medicine? Well, if you want to assess flow and function in one study to get a panoramic picture or overall idea, you can get a renogram as well as a renal syntogram, which means you get functional as well as quantitative information. You see activity within the cortex. You see blood flow as well as excretion at the same time. Why is this important? You want to see symmetry of blood flow. If there is asymmetry, you must suspect asymmetric renal arterial stenosis. This is a screening study. It is not a diagnostic study by any means. This is also a very nonspecific study. For example, here, we're assessing for renal failure. We see a photopenic area, very, very nonspecific, but we incidentally diagnose renal cell carcinoma. Again, these are posterior images, so left is on the left. What about DIMSA defects? For cortical evaluation or cortical scarring, DIMSA is a study of choice. We look for cortical DIMSA effects because if you see a DIMSA defect, that indicates that you've had scarring because of one or more episodes of urinary tract infection. You can't determine how much urinary tract infection has destroyed your kidneys simply by using avoiding study. You need to have a DIMSA defect. However, the DIMSA defect does not correlate very well with the risk for dialysis or hypertension when you're much older. So again, DIMSA, not very good, but we still use it. What about diuresis renography? If you've, got, if you've had surgery of your pelvis or collecting system, post-pyeloplasty, you can give them diuretics, but they will not empty completely. However, it is important to diagnose between structural and functional stasis of urine within the pelvis and collecting system. So there is a small role for diuresis renography, especially when evaluating PU junction obstructions or duplication of the collecting system. When do you give the diuretic? Really, whenever you feel like giving it, go ahead and give it. There is no standard time. Typically, if you see the collecting system, then you want to give it. However, if your technologist is not confident, then you know, set a st standard time. 15 minutes after the radio tracer has been injected, call me, I'll come and inject. Whatever tickles your pickle. Nothing standard over there. 
Polycystic kidney disease, again, very nonspecific. You're seeing photopenic areas that are deforming the pelvis and collecting system. Infiltrative disorders and renal cortex packing disorders can also present similarly. A heterogeneous pattern of renal perfusion. Obstructive uropathy, there is persistent activity in the pelvis and collecting system, does not empty even after you give diuresis. One of the older ways of diagnosing renal artery stenosis, this applies to those of you who do not have MRI, is to use something called captopril, which causes violent coughing fits, and it also exacerbates renal dysfunction on the same side. If you have asymmetric renal function after captopril is given, then you are more likely to have asymmetric renal arterial stenosis, which will, and this is important, improve after angioplasty. There are other methods of evaluating asymmetric renal arterial stenosis, and they have variable sensitivity and specificity. You can use the captopril renal uh, syntogram. You can use color Doppler sonography, which is more specific, but the best way to do this is by MR angiography. MR angiography is very good for screening, and it has very good negative predictive value. If you know you have asymmetric renal arterial stenosis using MR angiography, then you go ahead and do your captopril renogram. Why? The captopril renogram is going to tell you whether or not these patients will benefit from stenting. The best criteria to use is a difference in the time to peak increase by at least a factor of two minutes. So determine your time to peak increase. If this factor is greater than a threshold of two minutes, you are going to be significantly better off with stenting. Uh, you can abbreviate these studies by doing only the post captopril study. You don't have to do the pre and post study. Uh, however, if you are at risk factors because of your age of onset, if your pretest probability is higher, then you want to do the pre captopril study as well as the post captopril study. So in most patients, we just do the post captopril study. If there is symmetric flow pattern and renal cortical activity, it ends your search for uh, significant activity. An uh, entity called acute tubular necrosis is reversible failure of tubular function, very nonspecific. Anything from contrast injection to acute rejection can cause this. Remember, acute tubular necrosis is seen within minutes to hours after renal allografts are uh, uh, inserted in the body. Rejection, of course, takes more time than acute tubular necrosis. Surgical problems are seen more uh, along the timeline of a renal allograft. Surgical complications best assessed using an anatomic study, typically a CT. If you want to assess for the presence of rejection or flow pattern abnormalities, you want to do a nuclear medicine study. The urinary bladder, the most critical thing we're looking for is vesicoureteric reflux. The earlier thought was you need at least three episodes of urinary tract infection in a kid over one calendar year in order to qualify for a VCU. Now, we've all loosened up considerably even one episode of urinary tract infection with at least the child being on antibiotics for a 24-hour period is an acceptable indication for doing a voiding study. Avoiding study is going to assess the amount of reflux, whether it's just in the ureter, in the non-dilated or the dilated ureter and collecting system. So there are three grades for reflux using the nuclear medicine study. We always use it in girls. In boys, the first study is going to be a contrast voiding study because we want to evaluate the anatomy of the male urethra. So all follow-up studies are always done using nuclear medicine voiding studies. There's no need to undergo so much irradiation. You want to assess results of anti-reflux surgery. It's not more of an anatomic problem, but a functional problem. So it's always a good idea to use nuclear medicine voiding studies instead. You don't have to wait for the entire course of antibiotic therapy to end before these uh, children can be scheduled for the study. Uh, I always make it a point to collect the first sample of clean catch urine to submit for culture at the time of the voiding study. So you have uh, a temporal relation between uh, fluid, uh, culture, and uh, reflux at that time. Cyclic emptying of the bladder is good. The more times you fill the bladder and empty it, the more likely you are to elicit reflux. We warm saline at uh, room temperature in order to encourage the uh, amount of reflux. Uh, you want to determine and uh, detect the presence and duration of vesicoureteric reflux during each phase of your cyclic imaging. 
Again, the imaging does not alter the management or improve outcome. Remember, if you suspect reflux, even if you don't see it, and the child has documented multiple urinary tract infections, they're going to be on antibiotics to improve the prognosis. So again, though we know that DIMSA defects do correlate with scarring, there is not very good correlation in long-term prognosis. Is it necessary to get a sonogram? Yes. You need to get a sonogram before doing a voiding study if you haven't looked at the kidneys antenatally. Typically, if the kidneys have been looked at antenatally, which they have in all children born at our hospital, no additional information is going to be brought out using a pre-VCU sonogram. So don't waste your time and energy. We're not really sure what the importance of a voiding study is in the long term. This is again being evaluated in studies even as we speak. The problem is if I see even one episode of vesicoureteric reflux, the child is going to be on, a, on antibiotic therapy, which he or she would have been anyway if there were urinary tract infections. So it's probably not going to change anything. All of our data is based on evidence from the 1980s. We need something more current using more of nuclear medicine techniques than the contrast studies of uh, the old times. Again, DIMSA defects are a valid diagnostic tool, but we don't know the long-term um, sequela of this. Interestingly, if you look at children with vesicoureteric reflux, and of avoiding sister urethrograms, there is very poor correlation, which means you may or may not have an abnormal sonogram and doesn't correlate with your vesicle reflux either. Similarly, if you compare the presence or absence of symptoms and vesicle reflux, it doesn't correlate very well either. So again, a lot of work needs to be done in this area, but we're still doing it. Going to the target area that we're all concerned about, scrotal perfusion studies. Some people who are those without ultrasound machines do scrotal perfusion nuclear medicine studies. Why? We have no idea. Remember, this is not testicular imaging. You're not evaluating viability of the testicle. You're looking at the extracellular space around it, and you're making inferences. You're inferring things at that moment in time. If you have intermittent torsion, you are going to miss it. So what are these things we're looking for? We used to call it missed torsion, which is a legal nightmare because it means somebody missed it. Did you miss it? No. Did you? Then there's acute torsion and there's infection. So we now have it as late torsion, acute torsion, and epididymal orchitis. Again, late means we could have picked it up earlier, so we've got to get rid of that term. So we call it an infarction, ischemia, and inflammation. So typically, we're concerned with a painful hemiscrotum, which either could be infarcted, it's too late to do anything, ischemia, well, something bad's happened, but we can still fix it, or infection, which means you need uh, antibiotic therapy. Hyperemia is a reaction to the infectious agent, or it's a reaction to an infarcted testicle, because you've got dead tissue within, you're reacting by reactive hypo hyperemia or an inflammatory response. If you have central hypoperfusion, you either have ischemia or an infarction. Again, very, very nonspecific, because if you have an abscess, you're going to get a target surrounding photopenia as well. So it's more of a clinical diagnosis rather than a nuclear medicine study. What we're looking for is an area of photopenia, which infers that you have an ischemic testicle within that hemiscrotum. Better than nuclear medicine are sonographic techniques because you're going to evaluate the presence or absence of flow. Remember, it's not just the presence or absence of color flow. You want to analyze the spectral pattern, and you want to look for the presence or absence of diastolic flow. If you don't have diastolic flow, you can be pretty sure that ischemia happened or is happening. So you can rule out intermittent torsion. When you compare the numbers for sonography and nuclear medicine, they're fairly comparable. With sonography, you have a slightly higher accuracy. It is not statistically significant. It is operator dependent, which are the two uh, main pitfalls. So similar sensitivity, and they're complementary to each other. The advantage of sonography, if there has been trauma that caused the torsion, you can evaluate for hematoma or the integrity of the testicle itself. Uh, one of the important things is if you have uh, testicular ischemia, manual testicular detorsion, which sounds like a hideous thing, can be performed in the nuclear medicine suite under nuclear medicine control. So you can see how the hemiscrotum will regain flow pattern and dynamically. Again, this is not commonly done in North America, but oftentimes you can evaluate reperfusion if manual detorsion is uh, going to be effective. 
We're going to wind up with uh, a couple of uh, useless facts in inflammatory imaging. Remember, inflammation is a challenging thing. You've got to look all over if you don't know what the source of inflammation is. One of the useless ways of looking is using a labeled autologous white cell study. Unless you know exactly where to look, the yield of this is pretty low, but there are some specific areas where this can be tremendously useful. So depending on the indication, you can make something completely useless into something that is paramount and critical. How do you label these white blood cells? You can use any agent you want. Typically, you use it for pyrexia of unknown origin, where the yield is pretty low, osteomyelitis, or vascular graft infection. This is very good when you have a foreign body inside the body, and you want to see whether this is affected by infection or inflammation. How can you tag it? You can tag it either with indium-111 or technesium-99 MHMPAO. Depending on what you suspect the locus of infection to be, one or the other is going to be more or less useful. I like HMPAO because you can image the same day and you get a better signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, for labeling white blood cells, obviously you've got to have a significant number of white blood cells. If you're significantly leukopenic, then that's going to be a problem. You don't see significant bowel or urinary excretion, which is a definite advantage. HMPAO, you can re-inject if necessary. You image earlier, most importantly, this is of value in children because you need a smaller blood sample. You don't need a 60cc syringe, and it's a lower radiation dose when compared with indium-111. Uh, typically, bowel disorders, Crohn's disease, any inflammatory processes are going to show uptake of white blood cells, which are labeled, very nonspecific but very sensitive. If you've got infected bypass grafts, shunt tubings, these are going to show up as well. Ischemic or inflammatory or infarcted bowel is also going to show up. So wherever you have accumulated pathological numbers of white blood cells, you're going to see accumulation of pathological numbers of autologous white blood cells. Tips of stumps for amputation, uh, location, defects, and inf infection. Dr. Applebaum has talked to you about bone scanning. Remember, bone scanning may be supplemented by autologous white blood cell scanning because if you have sarcopathic changes, the bone scan can be very, very challenging to read. If you have sarcopathic changes, start with the autologous white blood cell study. If that is positive, you know that there is overlying osteomyelitis overlaid upon a baseline of degenerative and sarcopathic changes within the joint. Gallium-67 citrate is, is historical. It is like sinus radiographs. Some people still do it. I have no idea why. It has a long half-life, poor dosimetry, very high energy, very high background activity. Very difficult to determine if something's actually abnormal on a gallium-67 study. Why? Because it's seen in the bone, the marrow, the soft tissues, liver, and spleen, and it is excreted in the bowel. So very difficult to find an area of abnormality. People try and give cathartics to clean out the bowel activity. Very uncomfortable. These are sick people. You're looking for infection. Try and make them more uncomfortable. However, in the chest, it is invaluable in detecting quickly using something inexpensive for active sarcoid or interstitial pneumonia. Patients who are ineligible for FTG PET because of their insurance carriers can get a quick and dirty gallium scan to evaluate lymphoma burden. Remember, lymphoma likes to involve the nasopharyngeal, retropharyngeal, lymphoid sheets. How do you image them? You want to image them further out so that you can get clearing of background activity, typically around 48 or 72 hours after injection intravenously. If you are concerned about a specific area, it's invaluable to get a speck of that region so you can localize the abnormality better. Interstitial lung fibrosis shows patchy or uniform uptake of gallium within alveoli and the interstices between them. This is a good thing because this indicates the, the uh, Inflammation is active and will respond to fibroids at that given time. If you want to assess for activity of mycobacterial infection, you see old granulomatous residual, you see scarring, but you're not sure whether this is active tuberculosis. This is a good way of assessing it using gallium. Tuberculosis may be within the lungs or within lymph nodes. Sarcoid may be within the lungs, within the lymph nodes, the parotid, lacrimal, and salivary glands. You can assess the extent of whole body disease of tuberculosis and active sarcoidosis using a gallium-67 citrate. It's a very good and cheap way of following up these uh, patients. 
Metastatic melanoma also shows uptick because remember before FTG PET, gallium was used as a neoplastic staging and restaging agent. So while it is sensitive, it is not quite as specific. Few pitfalls, we do see significant hilar uptake in smokers, even though they don't have cancer. If you have had an injection of gadolinium recently or have had recent chemotherapy, it does decrease the uptake and reduces your sensitivity. Also, low-grade lymphomas and some leukemias will show no uptake. Again, this is not a guarantee of anything because some low-grade lymphomas will not show uptake using FTG PET examination. Remember, for lymphoma and PET, before your first cycle of chemotherapy, you need to undergo a PET scan. If the PET scan does not show uptake before your first course of chemotherapy, it will never show uptake again. This is important because you don't want to be falsely reassured when you don't see uptake after the first course of chemotherapy that the lymphoma is no longer there. So we've got what? A whole body scan. We've got anterior and posterior images. So what could this be, Doris? Yeah, I, I see uh, uptake distributing mostly in the liver, um, urinary bladder, a little bit in the salivary glands, and uh, I don't think I see a spleen. Um, there is pretty f uh, round focal increased uptake in the porta hepatis region of the liver, or maybe it's the gallbladder. Um, I'm not sure what scan this is. This Excellent. is my problem. So you're not sure, but you don't <laughs> see uptake in the spleen. Yeah. So it's this not is a spinning image, so it's not a PET scan. So it's not a sulfur colloid, unless the patient had a splenectomy. That's the first thing I thought. Mm -hmm. um, what else could this be? It's not an RBC scan because I don't see any pooling in the Excellent. part. Excellent. And uh, I don't, it is not a protectinate because I don't see anything in the stomach. Excellent. Um, there's nothing does? in the bowel. It's not a gallium. No. <laughs> I actually don't know what this is. How, how would you judge time. the um, overall quality of this scan? It's, it's very uh, low energy. It's uh, scattered. It's low... Um, uh, well, it's kind of cruddy, right? Yeah. It's not a pristine. It's a crappy scan. It's a crap scan. It's okay. a, uh, yeah. It's... Yeah. <laughs> does, that, does that help you narrow it? In fact, you said low energy, but often... Um, what really what you'd mean when you see uh, a crappy scan, the technical term for that is, is high energy isotope because um, they're harder to capture. If they're low energy, um, we generally can image them pretty well, but these high energy photons, you need real thick crystals. Unless this is an I-131. Okay. But then so, I don't see any thyroid. Okay. Um, so it is, and I put this on, up on purpose, uh, probably the hardest and scariest thing in the nuclear medicine section is, uh, oh my God, what kind of scan is this? Um, and it can be very intimidating, unlike, you know, an ultrasound of, uh, uh, you know, the thyroid. At least you know it's an ultrasound of a small organ or a CAT scan. You know, these aren't problems in most of the other sections. Um, nuclear medicine, um, really the scary thing is, Oh my God, what kind of scan this is. Um, but we're going to break it down and, and help you guys take away that fear factor. Because um, if you think about it, there really is only, um, what, you, what, you really, what you really get stuck on is not all nuclear medicine oh, scans, I know what this is. but you get stuck on the whole body scans. Because if you see dynamic images of the kidneys, if you see um, dynamic images, or if you see a lung scan or a VQ scan, you have no problem recognizing that. It's only these whole body scans that you're kind of like, oh my God, what, you know, what, what am I looking at? So um, there are only, there are really only a few. You can this break is an them down. It's a scan, isn't it? Um, close. So... Um, <laughs> There are just a few, a few whole body scans, and we can break down and decide which are which. Okay, so a bone scan is a whole body scan. Hopefully, uh, people that are going to Louisville soon, um, that's going to be obvious. You see, you see the bones and you see renal uh, excretion. Um, the two whole body scans that you can legitimately uh, cause you some consternation are the gallium and the white cell scans. Okay, because they both have three things in common, and that's liver, spleen, and bone marrow. Um, the gallium is generally, uh, the liver is generally a little hotter than the spleen. Um, and the white cell scan, the spleen is hotter than the liver generally. Uh, remember, gallium not only goes to bone marrow, but it goes to bone itself. That's important in pediatric cases because you'll see the growth plates, the bone itself. Um, gallium, the, the two other clues, you see physiologic colon and you see the salivary glands. The white cell 
indium white cell, you don't see the colon. If it's technetium, as Dr. Nayak uh, showed you, then you often can't. So liver, spleen, and bone marrow think gallium and white cells. Um, if the liver is hotter than spleen and you have colon and salivary glands, it's gallium. Spleen hotter than liver, you don't have colon, it's indium white cell. Uh, so the, the next one, Octrea scan, the only scan where you have whole body hot renal parenchyma, not the collecting system, but the parenchyma, uh, and the spleen are the hottest organs. Uh, the liver is mild as well. So you see hot renal parenchyma and hot spleen, it's, it's not tria scan, it has to be. Remember now, these are whole body head to toe scans we're talking about for the most part. And um, that just leaves two more, and that is the high energy scans. The, and you could say, you see a scan like this, it's crappy, you say, this is, appears to be a high energy isotope. Well, what you really are saying then is it's I-131, um, and there are two I-131 scans. One is pure I-131, looking for uh, thyroid cancer staging. Um, often these patients will have had a thyroidectomy, but you may see some residual neck activity. You'll see the star artifact in the neck. You'll also see salivary activity, um, stomach and bladder. MIBG, I-131, Generally, you have blocked the thyroid with Lugol solution. Um, you'll see, still have some mild salivary activity, but you'll have faint liver. You may or may not have the spleen, and you may have the bladder. So crappy scan or one of those. Really, that only leaves one more, and that's a antibody scan. The prostacent, we don't really do oncocent anymore. And antibodies hang out in the blood pool. Um, for days, and so that they get chewed up in the liver. So you're going to see blood pool, liver, and colon activity. And that's it. Um, that really is it. PET is a whole body scan, sort of, but it's a tomographic slice of the coronal, or it's a rotating whole uh, projection image. So you shouldn't be confused with that. And then the other ones that you may be confused about, sulfur colloids you mentioned, but those are typically coned down to the stomach and abdomen and pelvis. Um, these HIDA, red cell, Meckel scans, they're going to be dynamic. So you shouldn't be confused with those. Whole body, static planar views, bone, it's obvious, gallium and white cells look similar. We talked about how you differentiate them. Octrea scan, hot kidneys and spleen. The crappy two scans, we talked about how you differentiate those high energy isotopes and antibodies, liver and blood pool. And that's it. So let's go back. This is a HIDA scan. This is what? A HIDA scan. This is a HIDA scan. Um, what makes you say HIDA scan? Because I was looking through your list. There's no spleen in here at all. Okay. Well, again, the HIDA is going to be coned down to the abdomen and they're going to be dynamic. Well, because you're trying to trick me. Doris, we would never try to <laughs> trick you, Doris. Where, okay. where is the love? Yeah. Now, so you were on the right track. This is a high energy scan, right? Because right? of these photons. I was thinking it's I-131. Is this patient post thyroidectomy for cancer? Okay. However, we see the no spleen. Okay, but we do see <laughs> urinary bladder and uh, salivary glands. And and the nose. What's this? The liver. Okay, and we see the liver. So well, I went through the one scan. Diffuse mats is what okay. I was thinking. Okay, yeah. and then what's this? We were kind of looking at that before. You had mentioned the periportal region. What what other stuff lives around the periportal region? The gallbladder. Region? The gallbladder. What else? Okay. The gallbladder would be a little more lateral because it's right upper quadrant. Remember you said high energy. Now, it can't be high there because it's technetium 99 m That's 140 keV. What is higher energy than that and located up or around the adrenal, the, the, the MI, adrenal. Okay. MIBG. So if that's the adrenal, it's um, an MIBG scan. This would be an MIBG scan, and that is a... Well, I thought you see the spleen with the MIBG scan. Um, you may or may not. You may or may I not. I don't you see probably, a spleen here at all. You probably do see a little bit here. Are you serious? It's a crappy scan, Doris. Live with it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so Next this is up. an MIBG scan. This is the adrenal gland. Therefore, this is... Oh, we're back to Doris. Pheochromocytoma. Very, very good. Okay. And Doris said pheochromocytoma. Yes. Excellent. Who's next? Do we have a volunteer? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. So, what kind of scan are we looking at? And you can work it out out loud. We'll all, uh, we'll all help you, but... Uh, so this, okay, this is a whole body scan. Uh, we see liver, spleen, bowel, and some 
bone activity. So this is a gallium scan. Okay. Bo bone marrow and probably a little bit of bone, correct. Salivary gland activities. This is a gallium scan. Excellent. So we see uh, two to three foci of increased radiotracer activity along the left uh, side of the face and neck. And uh, I would think about tumors that have gallium avid or are gallium avid, such as lymphoma, melanoma. Those would be my two uh, most likely diagnoses. Um, sarcoid also has increased uh, activity with gallium. Okay. Uh, how, how else could we, uh, w where are these foci? Or do you, can you tell? We could tell? do SPECT imaging to further uh, localize or CT. <laughs> um, so again, I mean, again, they, they look like they are along the left side of the neck mm -hmm. and face. Superior. Uh, they could right. be involving lymph nodes. Uh, which would, again, be compatible with lymphoma. Okay. So you like lymphoma, uh, metastatic disease such as melanoma, a couple other gallium avid tumors that you could... Lung, lung cancers, hepatoma, okay. sar uh, sarcomas except for Kaposi's. Okay, good, good. So uh, tumors, um, lympho primary lymphoma, metastatic disease such as melanoma, uh, inflammatory infectious etiologies, any infection, you mentioned sarcoid, uh, that would be a possibility. Uh, anything else we could do or um, any other imaging modalities you'd like to see? CT. You can see a CT. Okay, so we have this focal uh, soft tissue, which is enhancing in the region of suspicion and. Yeah, probably a periauricular. What, what is the re region of suspicion called? Uh, <laughs> in the in a periauricular node. Periauricular node. Uh, or a. Uh, we're just making up terms. <laughs> yeah. In the preauricular space. You can see yes. the pinna. It does not involve the pinna. It does not involve the retroauricular lymph nodes. It's more in the parotid area. You're going to see involvement of the preauricular space. It's independent of the mandibular condyle, but in that location. So is that helping you any? To narrow your differential? Well, I, I still think it could be lymphoma, melanoma, um, or metastatic disease. Okay, very good. It doesn't narrow it much further than that. And this it doesn't help me at all. I mean, you just know where it is, but you knew that from the gallium scan. So sure. Right. It just helps you direct where your needle should go. Yeah. If you saw a big uh, central fluid with a large rind, you might think more of an infection, but that could still be necrotic tumor. Uh, this is a case of lymphoma. Okay, who's next? Excellent. Very <coughs> next. good. What kind of scan is this? We're clearly showing all the whole body scans we can. So, so we have uh, anterior and posterior whole body views, and the kidneys are both very uh, intense. I think it's an actria scan. Okay. Where in the kidneys? Is it, is it the collecting system? It's like the, uh, the cortex. Okay, the renal parenchyma itself, not just the collecting system, although, of course, there is some collecting system excretion. Any other organs that are particularly hot? Uh, there's diffuse uh, activity in the liver. Looks like the spleen, the okay. bladder. Okay. So the spleen, too. Renal parenchyma and spleen, very hot. This has to be, uh, unless there's pathology, but the normal distribution only will be seen in Octria scan. Very good. Anything abnormal? Well, there's uh, in the mediastinum. I mean, there's a faint focus of increased activity, uh, which I don't think is a normal physiologic activity. Excellent. So you see abnormality in the right paramedian anterior mediastinum, which in an octreous scan could be? Uh, a neuroendocrine tumor. Such as? Could be a pheochromocytoma, uh, islet cell tumors or any tumors with somatostatin receptors. Okay, so the mechanism of localization is somatostatin receptors. Uh, this is the very same distribution of tumors that we can image with an MIBG scan. What's the mechanism of localization for an MIBG scan? It's uh, something with norepinephrine. It's a norepinephrine precursor. precursor. Um, it's taken up by two cells, tumor cells that make uh, 
these kinds of hormones. So uh, looking at the same categories of tumors from different angles, either somatostatin receptors or uh, pr precursor for horm hormone synthesis, the renal parenchyma has a heavy concentration of somatostatin receptors. Um, that's why they light up normally. The spleen, you get all sorts of act act uh, activated macrophages, um, which also have lots of somatostatin receptors. That's why that lights up. So um, really the question is, well, we'll finish figuring out what, what this is. What would you like to do? We could do a spec to figure out where it is, um, but barring that. So we have a CT and in the right, uh, posteromedial uh, thorax. There's a large ovoid soft tissue density mass with um, some amorphous calcifications. Um, I'd be worried about a tumor. Wait, 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 wait. Is what? this a child or an adult? This is a, a child. Has he undergone any treatment? There's a, he has a, a port in the left chest wall. Okay, now let's put that all together before we give our differential. So I think it's some sort of tumor. Brilliant. That's why we have a port catheter. And uh, because it has calcifications, I'd be uh, considering a carcinoid tumor in this location. Um, Although it's paraspinal. Um, if you're about? looking at the posterior mediastinum and the paravertebral region, and this child is sick enough to get a venous access port with some amorphous granular calcifications, what should bubble up to the top of your list before a carcinoid? Neuroblastoma. Car Excellent. Very good, and that's what this turned out to be. Um, the, the question people ask, when would you do an MIBG scan, when would you do an Octrea scan, and they're, they're largely interchangeable. Um, remember the MIBG scan, because of the high energy radio uh, tracer, uh, image quality isn't going to be that good um, unless you have I-123 MIBG, which some people can get. Um, but also remember the Octrea scan, the kidneys are very hot normally, so a small pheo might be hidden just above it. So if you're looking for anything but a pheo, um, probably better off doing um, a Octrea scan. If you're looking for an adrenal pheo, I would go with an MIBG. Okay, who's next? You had a very good differential. Remember, if, if the paraganglioma is within the adrenal gland, it's a pheochromocytoma. Anywhere else, it's an argentafin tumor or a uh, pheochromocytoma. Or a paraganglion, sorry. Next. We're never going to stop with these whole body scans, are we? No. All right. Um, well, I see uh, on the whole body scan, I mean, I see uh, liver and spleen. Excellent. Anything um, else? Also bladder uh, and some minimal activity, it looks like, in bone marrow. Um, I don't see kidneys. You don't? You saw bladder, right? Yeah. How did that get there? Look at the posterior images. Yeah. I, the two kidney bean-shaped things. Well, I mean, I, one of the, I mean, that looks like the l posterior lobe of the liver. I mean, I get, I get that that's kidney. Okay. All right. So, um, so you see both kidneys, the parenchyma, you see... Right. What's that? Um, Remember, this is a posterior view. Right. I mean, I spleen. Around. Okay. So spleen and both kidneys are the hottest <laughs> organs, right? You uh, see a little bit of liver there. Right. So, I mean, this looks like an octreotide scan. Okay. Another octrea scan. So um, I've thrown you a curve and showed you uh, two in a row. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, there are multiple um, foci of increased radio tracer uptake um, within, uh, within the liver. Um, differential? Uh, the differential is, um, well, uh, um, basically, you have a, you know, a neuroendocrine term that's metastatic. Um, you know, this is oftentimes going to be one of the islet cell tumors considering its metastasis to the liver, gastronoma, insulinoma, glucagonoma, 
So really quite non-specific. Any somatostatin receptor-rich uh, tumor with metastases, the, the primary tumor may have been removed. This could be a follow-up study. Very good. So this is metastatic islet cell tumor. I believe this was uh, uh, insulinoma, but it uh, could be any of them, as you noted. But important point is kidney, spleen are the hottest three organs. Uh, Octrea scan. And okay. remember, it's extraordinarily wicked of him to give you two Octrea scans and just threw everybody off. Next. Okay. Um, this is an anterior view of a high energy study. I think it is actually showing the whole body um, in the anterior view. I see activity in what looks like bladder, um, some of colon, and then I think uh, the thyroid gland. I think this is probably an iodine uh, 131 study, probably looking for um, a follow-up study for metastatic disease. Metastatic um, what? Metastatic thyroid okay. cancer. So great. So this is a high-energy isotope. You've already narrowed it down there for the I-131, either I-131 by itself or I-131 MIBG. Um, you don't see liver. You see salivary, a little bit of salivary. You see probably colon and bladder. So it's I-131 scan. Very easy. And um, we see a couple foci in the head and neck. So you think there's recurrent and metastatic uh, thyroid cancer. Uh, this patient doesn't have a star artifact here. So um, the thyroid has been removed and probably even been ablated because just even the presence of an unablated thyroid remnant will often produce that star artifact. So I-131 scan, a high energy isotope, a recurrent uh, metastatic I-1 uh, thyroid cancer. Very good. Any volunteers on this side? Okay. Um, we have a total body scan with uh, uptake in the liver um, and a little above the spleen. I, I don't think that's a spleen unless it's really small okay. or that could be the finding. Okay. How about it's not projecting terribly well, but... But it does look like there's some uptake in the bone. Okay. Maybe faint activity there. How about um, what are these structures here? They look, they look like vessels. Why, why, are we, why would we be seeing the vessels? Um, some kind of uh, vasculitis. Uh, some kind okay. Maybe it's, the, maybe it's not the vessel wall, but what's in the vessel. And what's in the vessel? Blood or thrombus. Okay. So blood pool. So we're seeing liver and blood pool. Uh, unusual to see blood pool on a delayed whole body scan, and the liver is very hot. Um, so what does that narrow things down to? I was thinking it, it might be a gallium. Okay. Uh, normally don't see the, the blood pool on a gallium scan this, this uh, delayed. Um, we also would expect to see a little bit more colon, um, although this, this could be a gallium. The, the, the appearance is not... Um, incompatible with a, with a well-bowel-prep well gallium scan. But when you see this blood pool like this and the liver real hot. A tagged red cell? I don't, okay. I don't see a heart, though. I'd see a heart. Okay, right. right. So we don't right. see heart. So can't be um, and, the, and we'd see the spleen really hot for those. And those are typically coned down to the, to the abdomen and pelvis. And they're often dynamic to look for uh, bleeding. Um, although you could do a tagged red cell scan for look for hemangioma. We're in the whole body category. Um, so, be, um, this is one of the less common, this is a little harder than uh, some of the ones we've been showing so far. But uh, blood pool and liver uh, is a tip off that this may be a, a blood pool and liver, sulfur colloid? No. Okay. Uh, again, we don't typically do a whole body scan for uh, sulfur colloid. But um, this category oh, here, antibodies. liver, blood pool, and a little bit of colon, um, an antibody scan. Got it. And this is an antibody scan. You really can't say which one it is, although uh, we don't really do m many of these anymore except for prostate cancer. Um, 
and this is a prostacent. Um, we will also often do SPECT through the pelvis or in, in another organ of interest. Uh, there, this is a normal prostate uh, prostacent. I just wanted you to be able to um, try to recognize it and go through in your head uh, what the different options might be. Um, this is specific for prostate membrane antigen, so uh, anything that lights up has to be um, a prostate cancer. It, uh, as I said, other antibody scans would look just like this, but they're not used typically terribly often. Okay, who's next? You know, we'd love for you to take another scan because that was really difficult and, and weird. So, so please take this one. Otherwise, we'll feel really guilty. Oh, you're, you're, you might feel worse after this. Uh, I'm sure I will. <laughs> Go ahead. Another total body scan with, um, it looks like a bone scan. There's uptake at the epiphysis and there's uptake uh, within the bone, there's also uptake throughout the skull and in the liver and spleen. Okay, I'm glad you said bone scan because a lot of people say bone scan. That's why I'm showing it. Um, you, the last two things you mentioned, is that typical for a bone scan? No, the liver and spleen is. And liver and spleen is kidneys. certainly not typical at all for a bone scan. And I don't see kidneys. And you don't see kidneys, okay. So what else could this be? What, and what else are you seeing? I'm seeing uptake in the bowel, low. Okay. And beside the, the bone in the face and the uh, occipital area has increased uptake. Okay, so we're seeing liver, spleen, bowel, uh, bone marrow, um, and bone. Uh, what, what might that be then? Indium. Indium what? Oh, Indium 111. Uh, a tagged indium-111 white cell scan. Okay. Uh, typically, it doesn't go to bone. It goes to bone marrow, but this is clearly also going. This is bone marrow, but this is bone. Um, and indium also doesn't go to the colon. So if you want to uh, hypothesize a white cell scan, you'd have to say technetium, but even that would not go to the bone. I don't think it's gallium. Why not? Well, I guess gallium is a bone scanning agent, and it does go to the gut, so maybe it is gallium. Okay. <laughs> yeah, everything about this would be compatible with gallium. Liver, spleen, uh, bone marrow, colon, and bone. Remember, gallium is a bone cortex agent as well, so a fracture with remodeling will light up. So th what kind of scan is this? Gallium scan. This is a gallium scan, excellent. This is tough because people see the, the growth plates and they, they, get, they get confused. I think this may be a bone scan, but certainly this stuff is not a bone scan at all. Now this scan has abnormal finding on it. Yeah, this is a young child. Um, and in the right hip, there's increased uptake in the area of the right hip, maybe proximal femur. Okay, you sure that's just not patient rotation? Um, no, I don't. I see it on the anterior and posterior. Excellent. So you see something hotter on one view. You say, well, if it's rotation, that same region should be colder on the other view. But we have a double-headed camera. We've acquired these at the same time. It's hotter there, and it's hotter there. So it's real. If you're still not sure, you can get a spot view and have the patient uh, straighten out or even get another couple views. But here we have the frog leg, and it's, and it's there. So what are you thinking about? It uh, could be a... Uh Certainly a fracture, but I don't see any other ones. He's a young kid. I'm not sure how old he is and how big he is, but a slipped epiphysis would be one thing I would think about. Okay. I like fracture. A little low for a slipped epiphysis. The head is, is way up here. Okay. Um, where, where is this kind of? It's in the intertrochan? Oh, yeah, I guess it's more proximal uh, femur. Okay. I, I like fracture. Anything else? And it can always be in some kind of bone tumor. Okay primary or metastatic, uh, conceivably. It could be uh, even lymphoma of bone. Gallium is not terribly specific. Anything else you want to throw into your differential? Fracture, tumor, um, infection. Okay. Could this be an infection? It could be. Certainly could be. Okay. And I like the way you started with, frac with trauma, tumor, and infection. I would Almost any case you're given in any section, at least in your mind, have those ready to go at the top because those are going to be uh, covering about 95% of real life and maybe, you know, 70% of the boards, tumor, tr trauma, or infection. Uh, anything else you'd want to do at this point besides uh, get a history? 
Spect images. I don't know. Okay. Uh, how would Spect help you? Would it help you confirm that this is real or not? We've already done that. Okay. Would it help you localize it? We've already done that. Uh -huh. So probably in this case, actually, Spect wouldn't be particularly useful. Uh, any other images we could get? Any other kind of study? Oh, um, yeah, plain film. Would okay. Be uh, plain film is negative. What's this? So we got an MR instead, and we do have uh, an area of uh, high signal in the proximal femur, the greater trochanter area. Um, it's more intertrochanteric okay. with preservation of the cortex. Okay. So. And I don't. It looks like there's a line through it. Um, maybe it's just a cut. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, this kind of. Uh, shows that even though nuclear medicine gets a rap of unclear medicine, well, in fact, MRI in all its exquisite detail isn't always particularly use, useful to narrow it any further. There's edema here. This could still be a uh, tumor, although you often will see a mass. Uh, this could be a fracture that you're just not seeing the line with edema, although sometimes you will see the line. Um, but this can certainly be infection, and this was a case of osteomyelitis. Uh, in fact, it was multifocal. There's a uh, distal um, tib-fib focus. I think this is distal tibia focus also um, seen on anterior and posterior multifocal osteomyelitis. Okay, last one. What kind of study is this? Who's next? Okay, this is a whole body, a whole body nuclear medicine scan, and it shows uptake in the both the liver and spleen and in the bone marrow. Okay. And uh, this is, I would say that this looks like a sulfur colloid study. Okay, this could be a sulfur colloid. The one thing that I don't like about sulfur colloid is that we only we usually don't do whole body sulfur colloid, right? We typically go from here to here. This would be a okay. sulfur colloid distribution. So what's the what's the sulfur colloid distribution scan that does that we that we do the whole body at? Well, if you were looking for splenosis, then okay, fair enough, fair enough. You would um, again, we probably wouldn't start all the way at the head and go to the toes and go, you know. Why would you do a whole body scan if you're looking for splenosis? Where else do you find? Oh, you can see uh, accessory spleens, of, like post-trauma. You can see it in the chest. You can see it all the way down the pelvis, anywhere. That, that, that is true. Um, probably lower chest and abdomen, pelvis, but not head to toe. That would be a waste of time. So sulfur colloid goes to reticular endothelial system, right, because uh, uh, that, that's where the, the size of the particles gets taken up in the spleen and the bone marrow. So what other, whole, now what's the whole body scan that also goes to that same kind of distribution? Well, first of all, this, uh, the isotope looks like it's a, a pretty good quality study, so it's probably technetium. So I, I would say that this could be a technetium-labeled HMPAO white blood cell scan. Since okay. It goes to the bone marrow as well and the liver and spleen. Okay. Uh, this is a white cell. This is the white cell distribution. Um, and this would have to be pretty early on because you do get abdominal uh, colonic activity with white cell. This is actually, um, uh, this is an indium, indium oxine white cell scan. But it's the same distribution except for the colon. So the white cells also go to the marrow, spleen greater than or equal to liver and bone marrow. So. This could be a sulfur collar. The only thing against it is that we did go pretty much head to toe, um, but I, I don't think anyone would really fault you for that. Um, and your next choice then would be leaving it to a white cell scan. Okay, so whole body scans aren't really that scary if you just kind of break it down. Bone uh, is obvious. Gallium and white cell both kind of look like this, but gallium you'll have uh, colon activity. Um, you'll all, gallium you'll have also the salivary activity. Um, Blood pool, colon, and liver, that's going to be a prostate, a prostatin or antibody study. Uh, spleen and renal parenchyma, that's an uh, Octrea scan. High energy isotopes, I-131 or I-131 MIBG. Piece of cake. You guys did great. We'll now go to the pet unknown section with Dr. Nyack. Okay. Now, the easy thing is these are all pet scans, so Who's next? Anyone? we don't have to think very much. So these are two scans. Uh, two. One is a sagittal image, but the other one is a coronal image from a uh, PET scan. Excellent. And why is this a PET scan? Uh, there is so much of brain activity. There, there's way too much brain activity. You can see a little bit of heart activity. And uh, I can see some activity along the, in the supraclavicular region on the left side, along the, along the 
clavicle region on actually both the sides. Excellent. Bilateral supraclavicular activity. What is your differential? Uh, these could be lymph nodes, but in patients who are tense, it could be brown fat, it could be just tense muscles over there, but these look more uh, l localized rather than being a continuous, so probably these are lymph nodes. So how would you confirm or deny whether or not these are significant lymph nodes? So we've got what you're saying is bilaterally asymmetric supraclavicular hypermetabolic foci, which may or may not be lymph nodes. What do you want next? Uh, we can do an SUV on them. And the see. SUV is less than 2.5. Each individual SUV is less than 2.5. So these are, uh, that goes in favor of a more like an inflammatory process. So uh, uh, inflammatory things like uh, uh, not infection process like uh, tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, these could do that. Okay. And also you want to know, you want to know some clinical history. Very, yes. very important. Mm -hmm. You want to know why we're doing this. We're doing mm -hmm. this for staging of breast cancer. These are supraclavicular muscles. Remember, the muscles can look very asymmetric. They can look nodular, but they will not have significant uh, mm -hmm. hypermetabolic activity. Terrific. Who's next? Now, tell me the difference between the scan on the left and the scan on the right. I think one is uh, attenuation corrected and the other is not. No. Yeah. But good guess. Um. <laughs> what do you see on the scan on the left that you don't see, don't see on the scan on the right? I mean, it, uh, the f on the left, um, I do see the um, cardiac activity. Excellent. You see the left ventricular myocardium on the left. You do not see the left ventricular myocardium on the right. Why are we doing this? Why are we not seeing the left ventricular myocardium on the, the right side? Is this patient heart dead? Is he dead? Excellent. We don't do pet on dead patients. Not reimbursable. So we're not seeing activity in the heart because we're putting these people on modified diets. So remember, if you give these patients low carbohydrate, high protein, you give them the, the South Beach diet, you're going to see activity being shunted away from the heart because the heart has, is not very efficient in capturing glucose. Why is that important? Because obviously here we saw some mediastinal adenopathy. And we don't want to mask any epicardial lymph nodes. So whenever you're thinking of pathology in the thorax of the mediastinum, and which really means in anybody, you want to put them on a restricted pet diet so that you can shunt activity away from the heart and you can look for pathology very clearly. And remember, diet does affect uh, the distribution of radioglucose, as Dr. Applebaum shown you, if you've got a high glucose level or if you have insulin driving glucose, where does it all go? It goes into the involuntary musculature. It's a very good example. If you had a fatty meal or if you've had a meal just before the PET scan, all of the radioglucose goes right to the ass. It's a great example of showing people where food goes. So remember, we're trying to shunt food away and we want it to go to the area of pathology. So... Here we've got mediastinal adenopathy, and here we don't have this. We just have low-grade activity. This is the effect of diet, so it does not indicate that there's anything abnormal with the heart. Terrific. Who's next? Okay, he said single coronal PET scan showing. Okay, we see some heart activity, but not significant myocardial activity because these people are on diet. We do see activity in the colon. Remember, tricky area. The, the, the descending colon and ascending colon, very tricky areas because you could have a paracolic lymph nodes and we're missing pathology over there. Anything else? We see bilateral, significantly intense parotid activity. We see that pretty often, variation of normal. However, in this patient, this turned out to be left-sided parotid lymphoma. No other lymphoma, that is the only location. So while we do see parotid activity in, as a normal variation, you must think of things like lymphoma. Again, not significantly asymmetric, but the lymphoma was only on the left side. And you have to confirm that using CT or MR. Terrific. We have an anterior review of a PET scan. In the right. Well, that doesn't. In the right. There's in, there are multiple foci of increased activity in, in the so right hemisphere. Excellent. not only have you found one focus, there are multiple foci. Terrific. And also in the mediastinum, there are several foci of increased activity. Excellent. Um, also, in the, I think that's normal. 
uh, physiologic activity in the right um, renal collecting system. We see a small amount in the left renal collecting and system. And remember that is not hydronephrosis. You often see stasis. And you do see activity and in the bladder, bladder that is normal. Bladder foley, probably. What might this be? Uh, you know, it's injection site may have been in that area. Let's see. The, the injection site may be slightly proximal to that. Um, so I'm not sure. I think it's not really a, a physiologic structure. Excellent. This was focal extravasation, and then they tried to inject again. But very, very important, you absolutely need to know where the injection was because that is a very common pitfall, and you miss uh, appendicular metastases. So you've got lymphadenopathy probably over here and mediastinal pathology. What kind of disease are you thinking of? Uh, you know, could... Could be a primary lung tumor, non-small cell. Could be a uh, could be lymphoma. Excellent. Could well, be metastatic disease from another primary. Very non-specific. Great. Next. Doris. Uh, this PET scan reveals um, probably at least five uh, increased radio tracer uptake along the right axillary region. Excellent. Um, a little bit in probably the super. Mm, not supraclavicular, but uh, yeah, right there, kind of by the, uh, above the upper clavicle? thorax. It's about the clavicle. I don't think it's above it. Okay. So around the clavicle. Correct. Periclavicular. And, yeah. Um, if this patient has a primary tumor, then yes. this is very likely to be metastatic lymph nodes. And if this in is this a woman, distribution, axillary and supraclavicular, what tumors would you think of? Breast, number one, if she's... Female, well, I mean, could be a male too, but more commonly. In a right, 99% of them are women. Excellent. Next. So we have um, a focus of increased radio tracer activity. Where? Along the posterior right medial aspect of the... Uh, right apex. Okay, uh, the posterior right uh, medial <laughs> aspect of the apex. The apex is a tiny thing. So it's in the right upper lobe, posterior medial E. And okay, the right upper lobe, how many segments? We can't talk like medical students. We have to be specific. Uh, four segments. Which four? Oh, God. <laughs> There's apical. Okay. So um, could this be apical? No. It's posterior. Posterior. <laughs> so it's posterior. Okay. So posterior segment, you see an opacity. You see some air bronchograms, some nodular lesions. Corresponds with a significant focus of hypermetabolic activity. Anything else? I think the rest of the distribution is That's pretty much normal physiologic. by distribution. Great. So your differential would be? This looks on the CT. It looks like a granulomatous or infectious process. It doesn't look like a primary neoplasm. Mm -hmm. I'd probably want an SUV measurement. Four point three. Four point three. Well, infectious or inflammatory process can, processes can still give you elevated SUVs. Um, so, what do you want to do? I, I mean, I'd, I'd need some clinical history and. Um, I don't think a chest radiograph would be that helpful. Um, well, you've got a chest CT. Right, exactly. Uh, well, one of the things you can do is de take a delayed SUV measurement. If you have sarcoid or tuberculosis, the delayed SUV will fall. So wait for an hour. Patient's already injected. Just take a delayed image. And if it falls significantly, you know it's active inflammation. But okay. if it does not, then you have to be suspicious for malignancy. So this is recurrent breast cancer. Again, very, very, very nonspecific, but sensitive. Great. So remember, for breast cancer, you don't do it for screening. You do it for staging and restaging and evaluation of response to therapy performed during the course of treatment. Next, please. We have a, we have a coronal Excellent. whole body uh, PET scan. And... There's two round foci of markedly increased activity in the liver, one in the right lobe, one in the left lobe. Anything else? Uh, there's a, a faint focus, a small faint focus of increased activity in the right kind of paramediastinal uh, region. Not significantly hypermetabolic by numbers. Okay. So what is your differential here? 
Uh, I'd be worried about uh, tumor, either primary or metastatic to uh, Why are these liver. donut pet lesions? What is the importance of a donut pet lesion? Uh, there might be central areas of necrosis. Excellent. And that's very important because if you have central liquefactive or necrotic change and you want to needle these lesions, you don't want to needle the center. You want to needle the periphery. So it helps as a guide for biopsy. Excellent. So multiple liver metastases, only one was seen on CT. Remember, MR and PET are better for liver metastases as compared to CT. Great. Who's next? So if you I'm notice uh, the trend, the, the later the study is, the more lesions there are. Colonel PET scan, we have multiple foci of increased activity um, Excellent. along the midline. Um, periaortic region. I mean, these could represent uh, periaortic lymph nodes. Um, Are we done? In a process such as lymphoma. So we've got a midline lesion. Anything else? Well, very subtle, very subtle finding. Mm. All right, so uh, there's a, another uh, focus of Increased activity in the uh, area of the uh, right, uh, you know, trochanter. Excellent. So y w what we're looking at is not only retroperitoneal adenopathy, but we're also seeing appendicular skeletal involvement. So differential would be? Uh, differential is going to be uh, lymphoma that metastasized to bone or a bone tumor that metastasized to lymph node. Um, Excellent. Uh, this happened to be breast carcinoma. There's no way. But we really didn't suspect the retroperitoneal adenopathy because those are asymptomatic. This patient was symptomatic with right-sided hip pain. And while looking at this entire study, we can upstage the patient because we have several metastases. Uh, this is another example very similar to the one that you saw earlier where you saw liver metastases. Uh, this was actually a cholangiocarcinoma, unsuspected in someone who also has breast carcinoma. So while very sensitive, it's not very specific. Once we find the lesion, we have to overlay it on the CT and then needle it to get the histological diagnosis. Uh, remember, for colorectal cancer, you do PET scan when you have a rising CEA or carcinoembryonic antigen level after surgery. If the CEA rises, then you can do it for restaging purposes. Initially, uh, the PET scan is done for diagnosis and initial staging as well. Uh, next. Okay. Two coronal images from a PET scan. Excellent. Um, there's increased uptake in the uh, right, the medial aspect of the right hemithorax. The medial aspect of the right hemithorax, right there, longitudinal in nature, not like the typical dotted lymph nodes that we saw before. Anything else? Very subtle finding. Um, in, the, uh, in the midline, in the uh, upper abdomen, there are two foci of increased uptake. Excellent. And we know that these are in the anterior upper abdomen because we can see the left ventricular myocardium. Again, if you had the spinning image, you would know that. So we've got anterior upper abdominal focal uh, metabolic uh, activity, and you've got longitudinal lower thoracic posterior because you can see the kidneys, longitudinal activity. What kind of thing would you be thinking of? What's so I think that... Um there's probably a primary lesion in the chest and maybe uh, metastatic disease uh, Excellent. in the abdomen. Now, what typically would be a primary tumor in the chest, longitudinal, with anterior upper abdominal nodal metastases, that would render this patient inoperable? A longitudinal tumor, you um, think about neurogenic tumors, but um, they usually often don't metastasize. I guess something else that could do is... What are the longitudinal structures, anatomic vascular structures? Vascular structures. Um, maybe something like a, a... Tubular longitudinal from the thorax to the abdomen. Something like a chemodectoma or something, um, or a sarcoma. And a common anatomic organ that is longitudinal extends from the thorax to the abdomen. 
Uh, esophagus. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Esophageal cancer with pre-celiac nodal metastases. Remember, it uh, is approved for diagnosis, staging, and restaging purposes. Terrific. Next, please. A single image of the PET, single coronal image of the PET scan. Excellent. And, and we can see multiple areas of uh, uptake in the upper mediastinum, the left side of the neck, and uh, the left supraclavicular region. And uh, these seem pretty dense. The rest of the abdomen, the chest looks okay. The abdomen looks uh, remarkable. Uh, so uh, focusing on the chest, these are multiple. I would like to see what the SUV is, if it's higher than... All significant. I would be concerned about uh, metastatic lymph nodes. From? I'm, I'm trying to think which, <laughs> which one of these could be the primary... Uh, but I don't know. I can't say that. So you've got bilateral some... mediastinal, bilateral supraclavicular, and slightly asymmetrically more prominent right hilus. Statistically, mm -hmm. what would you bet on? I would bet on uh, a breast cancer or a lung CF. Excellent, excellent. Again, uh, these are just mets from head and neck cancer. Very unusual, head and neck going to the chest itself. Uh, this is another example of lung parenchymal metastases. These are from uh, thyroid cancer. Rather unusual, but we do see it once in a while. So head and neck cancer is approved for diagnosis, staging, and restaging. Very, very, very sensitive study. Next, please. This is a three-dimensional um, uh, view of the PET scan. Excellent. Which demonstrates um, a single focus of uh, hyper, uh, hypermetabolism okay. on the... Um, on the left. And uh, what is this called on CT? If you see a single focus, little nodule. Single the, pulmonary nodule. A single pulmonary nodule. And if you have a solitary pulmonary nodule, you can do a PET scan. Why? Because if the PET scan is hypermetabolic, what can you do? Um, uh, you can um, direct the um, biopsy site. Right. You can overlay it, and if it corresponds to the CT, you can needle it. What if it's negative? If there's no significant hypermetabolic focus that can be overlaid, what can you do? If there is no other um, area of hypermetabolic area, then uh, you could do the SUV unit and see if it is... Um, no, there's, there's no, there's no activity at all. So it's, it's not that there is hypermetabolic activity, which isn't significant. You okay. don't see any significant hypermetabolic activity corresponding to a solitary lung nodule. What is your next step? You see a solitary lung nodule on CT. You don't see a corresponding hypermetabolic focus on CT. What do you do next? You still biopsy it? Yes. But then why are you doing the PET scan? No, um, you wouldn't biopsy the uh, nodule seen on the CT because it's not hypermetabolic. So if you have a, hyper, if you have a non hypermetabolic nodule? You can just follow up. How, how often should you follow that up? Uh, close follow up until two years. So um, how close is close? Every Friday? Uh, every six months. Every six months for two years? Yes. Again, a good answer, but very debatable. Nobody really knows, because we have some cancers, especially the, the more aggressive small cell cancers, the bronchoalveolar cancers, and the carcinoids, which will not show significant hypermetabolic activity. So one of the things you can do is needle it anyway, if it's of a large enough size, which, which means why are you doing the PET scan? Well, you're doing the PET scan to assess the extent of pathology. You want to see if there's mediastinal or hyla adenopathy or distant metastases, which makes it inoperable. Also, if the PET scan is negative, you might want to repeat the PET scan after a short while if the patient has other risk factors, familial, genetic, or environmental, that make it at a higher risk. And if that's so, then you can still go ahead and biopsy it. So again, no solid answers at this time, but that's a good approach. You want to follow it up using either CT or uh, follow-up PET scan. Uh, this is just a good example of showing you how you can have a negative bone scan except for some coaxial remote traumatic rib fractures, but you can see extensive metastases on the PET scan. So PET scan is very good for osteolytic metastases, but the bone scan is much better for osteoblastic metastases, as Dr. Applebaum told you. So these are complementary to each other and not independent of each other. Okay, next. So coronal and sagittal... PET, uh, multiple foci of abnormal uptake, uh, the multiple areas of increased uptake within the spine, Excellent. see the thoracic, thoracical lumbar junction, sacral region. There's also abnormal uptake in the left 
uh, chest. It should be somewhat posterior since we see the kidneys on that view. Um, so we have bone metastasis. Uh, so we've got osseous metastases and in possibly, the vertebral column. Possibly a pulmonary source given that should be somewhat posterior. Um, I think it's too far posterior for breast. Excellent, because we can see the kidneys, and then we've got chest wall pathology as well. So diffuse osseous metastasis, very, very nonspecific, that turned out to be non-small cell lung cancer. Again, you've got to have a histology of non-small cell lung cancer. Some small cell lung cancers do not show uptake of FDG. Next, please. Uh, coronal through the... Um, we can see the kidneys, so we're relatively posteriorly. Um, we see a large amount of uptake in the area of the mediastinum, a big mass-like lesion, and we're, it looks like we're going posterior to anterior, the heart's... Excellent. So this is actually a case of Dr. Applebaum's. It's, it's the first PET CT that was acquired in his new toy, and what we see is significant lobular uptake in the thorax, and uh, more posterior very lobular, what are you going to think of in that part of the thorax? Some paraspinal mass that uh, could be, uh, it looks like an older patient, so it could be something like a, um, a neuroblastoma would be in a younger patient. It's something, some neural-based tumor or, or posterior spine. It's more posterior, but it's lobular like a mass of lymph nodes in the mediastinum, you must think of lymphoma. lymphoma Remember, yeah. lymphoma and melanoma, very, very avid. This is residual lymphoma. Lymphoma, you must do it before your first course of therapy because not all lymphomas are FDG avid. If it's not FDG avid before chemotherapy, it will not be FDG avid after chemotherapy. You can use it for restaging purposes as well. Again, diffuse lymphoma with residual tumor in the mediastinum, in the axilla, and several groups of lymph nodes as well as in the, the uh, bones. Melanoma can look exactly like that. Remember, small lesions of melanoma, as small as 11 millimeters in size, very, very glucose avid. So a PET scan is uh, the study of choice for melanoma, uh, either for diagnosis, initial staging, or restaging. A uh, couple of things to remember when you're reading a PET scan. Uh, always have some history with you because it's very sensitive but not specific. If you're not doing PET CT, think about doing it. Otherwise, use fusion software to overlay with conventional imaging modalities because the PET scan just tells you about function. You want anatomic information to be able to stage it using NCCN criteria. You want anatomic information to direct your needle. You want anatomic information to increase your portal of radiation. Always determine specific uptake values. Uh, we determine minimum, maximum, and mean specific uptake values for each lesion, which may be a bit of an overkill, but it makes us more confident in diagnosing and staging cancers. Uh, always try and correlate with the pathology. It, it's one way of learning. For example, the parotid and thyroid uptake, we try and qualitate them, uh, qu quantify them as much as possible because it's a learning experience. Lots of artifacts. Artifacts are the key unless you realize and recognize the artifacts, you're not going to be able to respond to them. I'm going to be giving uh, several of the talks in this session, which is on chest radiology. And of course, this is a very large subject, and we're not going to attempt to be completely comprehensive. Hopefully, we'll touch on some of the points of interest, some of the points of confusion, and show you some interesting cases. In the first talk, I'm going to focus on a diagnostic approach to pulmonary nodules and masses. As you know, nodules are a common problem in the chest. We may encounter them on a chest radiograph, as shown here, or increasingly on a CT scan. And of course, there is a standard diagnostic list of differentials that you're well aware of that apply to this kind of a lesion. But with increasing experience, we realize that some of these are much more common than others. So just to mention some of them briefly before we come back to them in detail, what is the probability of a small nodule like this being a lung cancer? Uh, that's going to depend 
clearly on the size of the nodule, its morphology, the patient's age, and smoking history. Uh, generally, as the nodule gets larger, cancer becomes a more likely consideration. The metastasis is a surprisingly unusual uh, option in the case of a single nodule in a patient who does not have a known primary. Uh, if a patient does have a known primary lesion, of course, a metastasis becomes a likely option. In the Midwest especially, granulomas are very common, and these may or may not calcify, though as they get larger, they are more likely to be calcified. So in general, granuloma and primary lung CA are going to be two of the most likely options for a nodule like this. Infection and infarct aren't mentioned so often in the textbook differentials because these differentials are often based on surgically resected nodules or autopsy series. But in clinical practice, even a bacterial infection can be very nodular at an early stage. So that's certainly a possibility. And hamartoma, of course, would be the commonest benign lung tumor. In many series, around 5 to 6% of all resected nodules turn out to be hamartomas. And they have some specific characteristics that allow us to identify them. Uh, less common causes are going to be things like carcinoids, arteriovenous malformations, uh, vasculitis such as Wegener's, rheumatoid nodules, and of course the, the list is virtually endless, but in any one case we're dealing with uh, probabilities and we need to make a determination of what's the most likely option. Now lung cancer detection is a big issue for us clinically and it's, it's a medical legal issue too and this is partly because so many cancers are overlooked and it's a uh, an area where we are likely to encounter malpractice litigation. Uh, John Mom did a study in 1983 based on chest X-ray screening program at the Mayo Clinic and found interestingly that when they took chest X-rays at four monthly intervals, in 90% of the peripheral cancers that were detected, they were visible in retrospect on the earlier radiograph four months earlier, although two independent observers were looking at these chest x-rays, specifically looking for lung cancer. This doesn't really mean that they were missed in the sense that they should have been diagnosed, but there was usually something there in retrospect. And 75% of perihilar cancers were visible in retrospect. And interestingly, John Austin has done another study on 29 missed lung cancers and found the average size was up to 1.6 centimeters. This is a scatter plot of the distribution of the missed lung cancers in John Austin series that was published in Radiology. And it's worth looking at this because the distribution of these cancers reflects both where primary lung cancers tend to be, which is predominantly in the upper lobes, and also the fact that many of these are obscured by bones and other overlying structures. So about 80% of the cases actually had some overlying obscuring structure. Overlapping bones in 82%, overlapping heart or hyla in 18%. And the majority of actually the case of missed cancers were female in this series, perhaps because at that time there was a lower index of suspicion. This is just a typical example of a missed lung cancer. And I think it's always challenging to look at a chest x-ray with a missed lung cancer. And every time we confront a chest x-ray, we really have to have at the back of our mind, especially in older patients and smokers, that there may be a small lung cancer hiding there. And on the frontal radiograph, there's really nothing detectable except perhaps a little extra density behind the left hilum there. On the lateral view, I think you can see that in the posterior part of the uh, image behind the hilum, there's a nodule overlying the spine. And that indeed is the lesion. And on the CT scan, of course, it's uh, clearly delineated. It's almost two centimeters. And this is actually an adenocarcinoma. So just a typical example of the kind of lesion that would be visible in retrospect, but which is a very high chance of being missed on the initial chest x-ray. It's important to pay attention to the lateral view because, again, in Austin's series, 17% were actually seen better on the lateral view. And I encourage and challenge our residents to try to interpret the lateral view first and try to pick up what you can on that before you look at the PA view. Uh, apical or posterior, uh, 96%. So how can we determine what the nodule is? Is this something that we have to pursue aggressively or that we can watch or forget about? And some of the basic criteria are going to include the size, morphology, growth rate, and calcification. The size is really a very important criterion. 
And the larger a nodule is, generally, the more likely it is to be malignant. Um, the smallest nodule we can usually detect on a chest X-ray, if it's not calcified, is around four to five millimeters under optimal conditions. And this is such a nodule. I don't know if you can see it on the projected image, but there is something projected over these two crossing ribs at this point. This is about a six millimeter nodule, but this is what we'd call a threshold lesion. It's just about as small and as faint as you're likely to be able to pick up, and you'd be lucky enough to pick that up. Um, this was, as it turns out, a metastasis from a colon cancer. Again, in a patient with a known primary lesion, the chance of a metastasis becomes much higher. But uh, we would have a hard time picking this up in other locations, such as at the lung bases. So malignant nodules are going to be distributed throughout the size range. Obviously, they have to start very small, and they will continue to grow. The vast majority of benign nodules stay small and don't get larger than a centimeter. It's very unusual to get a three-centimeter mass that turns out to be a benign lesion. It does happen, but statistically, size alone actually says a lot about the likelihood of malignancy. And uh, actually, there has been a... Uh, more information coming out about this from the screening studies which have looked at the relationship between the size and the probability of malignancy. And this is just a, a summary of some of the data that's come out of the LCAP study in New York, which was one of the first large screening studies done recently with CT in this country and at the Mayo Clinic. And uh, if you look at the numbers, it, it's interesting. They're, of course, less than three millimeter nodules are things we only see on CT scans. But based on the Mayo data, and we don't have corresponding numbers in each size bin because of the way that they were analyzed in each study. But, but based on uh, Steve Swenson's study at Mayo, only about one in a thousand of these less than three millimeter nodules turned out to be malignant. So the vast majority of those are going to be benign. Even in the two to five millimeter range in LCAP, they found only one malignancy. Uh, four to seven millimeters, it gets greater. And once you get into the sort of six to 10 millimeter range, you, you have a very significant percentage of lung cancers there. Uh, and again, as they get larger, the percentage of malignant lesions becomes progressively higher. Once you're over two centimeters, the large majority of non-calcified lesions turn out to be malignant. So size alone is certainly an important predictor. And there, there's a lot of controversy right now about the significance of very small nodules and at what intervals, if any, it's appropriate to follow them. And again, more data is coming out on that from the ongoing screening studies. So we have to consider size. We also consider the morphology, the shape and outline of the lesion. We can look at whether it's solid or non-solid, also known as uh, solid or ground glass opacity. The LCAP group have coined the terms solid and non-solid. We can look at those edge features, like whether they're spiculated, lobulated or smooth. And none of them are entirely reliable, but they do say something about the likelihood of malignancy. So this would be, of course, an example of a smooth nodule and is very sharply defined smooth uh, margins. In general, a smoothly marginated nodule is more likely to be benign than a primary carcinoma. But in the case of someone with a known primary, and actually this was a patient with a primary sarcoma, uh, that rule does not hold because metastases commonly can be smoothly marginated. And a lesion like this in a patient with a known primary, of course, is quite likely to be a metastasis. But uh, in, in a patient without a history of primary, a smooth lesion is more likely to be benign, all other things being equal. Lobulation, such as, as you see in this case here, is quite uh, characteristic of a primary carcinoma of the lung. Again, it's not specific, but many small peripheral adenocarcinomas have this lumpy, so-called lobulated appearance. Uh, spiculation has a fairly high correlation with malignancy, especially as lesions get larger. And this would be a typical spiculated lesions with a lot of these spiky projections. From it. I think the problem about spiculation is I see many people using the term spiculation rather freely. So you know, many scars and granulomas have one or two little lines coming out from them. It doesn't really make them speculate. And I think the series in the literature that look at the predictive value of speculation are talking about genuine speculation such as you see here. So uh, one has to be careful how one applies these terms. 
And then the solid versus part solid, again, a lot of new information coming out about this. We didn't really know much about these part solid ground glass lesions before we had uh, CT scanners with high resolution capability and a lot of the lung cancer screening data that's coming in now. But this would be a typical so-called part solid lesion, ground glass in the periphery, solid in the center. And in fact, this particular pattern is considered now very, very suggestive of adenocarcinoma or its uh, subset, bronchoalveolar carcinoma. This was in fact a bronchoalveolar carcinoma. So a lesion that looks like this, particularly with rounded convex margins, should be treated with a very high level of suspicion because it's probably going to be malignant. Again, a little more about non-solid and part-solid nodules. And, uh, at the University of Chicago, we've had the opportunity to look at a large database from Japan collected during a, a screening program and looking at which of these little non-solid and solid lesions turn out to be malignant and if there's any way to predict from the morphology. Well, it's certainly very difficult. I will tell you that of these four lesions, two are benign and two are malignant. And that's not very reassuring, is it? Um, they're all in the size of five millimeters or less. And I don't think that any of us could have a high level of confidence in, in predicting which of these is malignant. But it does turn out that there are some features that tend to favor benign versus malignant. This is a benign lesion. And this was judged in a, a blinded observer test to a relatively straight or polygonal shape rather than be, having rounded margins. Some of the, the margins are almost concave. And I think the straightness versus convexity of margins can be somewhat helpful. This one is, is malignant, and like most of the malignant lesions in this series that were ground glass, it tends to have a more round or bulging margins. Uh, this one was benign, again, somewhat straight margins, and this one was malignant, uh, somewhat rounder. But that's certainly a very subtle distinction, and I don't think anyone could pretend to be certain. Uh, this one has a little... Uh, central, more dense opacity, which raises one's level of suspicion for a malignant lesion. Uh, so in this series, uh, which is, uh, will be published shortly, I believe, we found that roundness, in the case of the non-solid or ground glass opacity lesions, tended to favor malignant lesions, whereas a polygonal shape or straight margins tended to favor benign lesions. And in the case of the part solid lesions, again, roundness tended to favor malignancy and straight margins tended to favor benign lesions. Um, <clears throat> but certainly one has no choice but to follow lesions like this. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning in passing is that the, the growth rate, um, and I'll say a little bit about this here, tends to differ between the non-solid and the solid lesions. What uh, growth rate should we expect from a carcinoma? Well. Here is a, a retrospective uh, case where carcinoma was picked up subsequently, and we have an almost invisible little scar-like opacity in the periphery of the chest X-ray. I don't think any of us would have made particular note of this or would have assumed that it was a scar. One year later, looking at it carefully, it just looks a little more convex, and the scar looks a little thicker. This is always a very sinister sign and should raise one's level of suspicion. In the third year, it's clearly turned into a nodule with convex margins, and that kind of progression over three years is very typical of an adenocarcinoma. Uh, again, it's easy to see in retrospect, but very hard to identify prospectively. So the growth rate of nodules is generally described in terms of volume doubling time. And remember that the 26% in a diameter increase equals one volume doubling. So 26% uh, increase in diameter is not a lot for a small nodule, and it can be actually quite difficult to detect reliably, especially if we're not using very thin slices. So the range for typical primary lung cancers is said to be a volume doubling time in the 100 to 200 days with a range of 30 to 400 days. On the other hand, the data from the screening program suggests that many of these small adenocarcinomas tend to grow rather slowly when they're very small. Here's a series from Hasegawa. This was published in the British Journal of Radiology a couple of years ago. And it tends to confirm what we've kind of realized anecdotally based on cases that we've been seeing for some years. Uh, basically, Hasegawa pointed out, as you see here, that in the case of a less than 10 millimeter nodule, the volume doubling time tends to be 
longer than in the case of the larger lesions. The suggestion is that as lesions get larger, they start to grow faster. So the growth rate is not actually linear. And the traditional volume doubling times are based on chest x-rays, which only detect these larger lesions. Uh, they also found that there were a lot of cancers in non-smokers. In Japan, they currently screen both smokers and non-smokers. It seems everyone from certain villages turn up when the CT scanner arrives. And very interestingly, they found exactly the same incidence of lung cancer in their non-smokers detected by CT. Most of these were small. Their death rate from cancer in non-smokers is four times that in smokers, so there may be some contamination by secondhand smoke. But nonetheless, it does support the overdiagnosis argument that a lot of these small cancers actually are not going to kill the patient. Again, the growth rate in the non-smokers was distinctly slower. A lot of these turned out to be ground glass lesions. As we'd expect, slower growth rate in adenosia, faster growth rate in small cell. Ground glass non-solid lesions tend to grow very, very slowly. Mixed ones, intermediate, solid ones, uh, rather faster. And although it isn't documented per se, the implication is that many lesions start out as ground glass, become more solid, and start to grow more rapidly over time. So, of course, again, we have to end up by following these lesions and making a decision as to whether they're growing or not. And technique becomes very important in this situation. Uh, I want to emphasize this by showing you this particular case. Uh, this was done in October of 2002, at a time when some of our sections were still using 7 millimeter collimation for chest CT scans. The upper two sections, which are consecutive sections through the abnormality, were taken with 7 millimeter collimation. And two high resolution sections um, were also uh, obtained at that time. And uh, I will show you the results of those. Actually, all of these were taken at 7 millimeters. This is 1, 2, 3, 4. This is a sequence. You see that there's just a faint poorly defined opacity in this, in this area of the lower lobe, which could be scarring. It was a patient with head and neck cancer. There certainly is some fullness here. I think there was a hiatus hernia, but it's difficult to call this a cancer. We happened to have at that time a random thin section that went through the lesion because we had and continued to do six high resolution sections from top to bottom through the lung, just mainly to assess for interstitial lung disease. So one of these cuts happened to go through that area, and this is the corresponding seven millimeter cut. So it's very clear on the thin section that there's a solid abnormality here, and this had not been there on earlier lesions. So a very striking difference in the information from the thin and the thick section. The patient came back in 1202. Uh, again, at this time, we had seven millimeter sections, which you see here, again, looks like a very poorly defined lesion, perhaps speculated, but not completely solid looking. And here are the thin sections we, which we obtained through the same lesion at the same time. Corresponding seven millimeter section. Look at the difference in detail between those. So I think this just supports the trend of going to thinner and thinner sections for chest. And of course, with the newer multi-detector scanners, this is going to become routine. We may view some of the sections uh, at five millimeters, but we can interrogate the data at one millimeter. So certainly when following and measuring lesions, thin sections are going to be very important. Just uh, another example, I think, that typifies the problem. A patient who came to our emergency room with uh, dyspnea, I believe, and a, a diagnosis of possible pulmonary embolism, had a CT scan, showed this very nonspecific small lesion in the periphery of the right upper lobe. It could be an old infarct, a scar, but it's the kind of thing that one would follow. Here we are over a year later. Well, it does look a little bit larger. You wonder about differences in section level. It looks a little irregular. Certainly, uh, one would be concerned that this could be a carcinoma. Here we are in uh, 4 of 03. Now it's becoming distinctly more convex, a little broader based. And here we are in January of 04. Uh, you may wonder why there is no intervention. Basically, this patient has got a lot of other problems. And uh, I think it's understood that this probably is a slow-growing adenocarcinoma. But just look at this rate of growth from uh, 2001 to 2004, and you can see why the uh, very small changes can be easy to miss, especially if you're not using high-resolution technique and you've got different centering of the sections in each exam. All of these were done at uh, 1.25 
millimeter collimation uh, with a pitch of one, so we're able to perceive this difference. Again, I assume that this is an adenocarcinoma. So much for growth rate. Um, what about calcification? There are, of course, classical patterns that characterize benign and malignant central, laminar, and dense diffuse calcification characteristic of benign lesions, popcorn calcification in the case of hamartomas, Eccentric calcification is nonspecific. It doesn't mean a lesion is malignant, but it's not reliable for it being benign. And sometimes a diffuse sort of a stipple pattern one can see in dystrophic calcification in cancers. Up to 10% of primary lung cancers can have calcification, mostly dystrophic or engulfed. These are both lung cancers. Most calcified lung cancers are large. It's less common to see calcification in very small primary lesions. Uh, again, most commonly dystrophic, mostly large, and a speckled or irregular pattern is the most common thing. I think this pattern that you see here is most typical of uh, dystrophic calcification. It doesn't predict the cell type. It can be adeno or squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, certainly a combination of central and laminar, which we see on this chest X-ray, is pathognomonic. This is one of the few completely reliable signs probably in radiology we would not recommend following this uh, lesion further because this is typical of a healed histoplasmoma. Similarly, very dense calcification, such as you see here, is pathognomonic of benign lesion. This actually is a carcinoma. Just uh, contrast the difference in density between the two lesions. Something that's end on, like this little thing here, uh, can be either an endon vessel or it can be a calcified granuloma, but we know that a non-calcified lesion of this size will be invisible. Therefore, we don't worry about those very small, high-density lesions. Of course, multiple small calcified lesions such as this, typical of previous histoplasmosis. A more tricky situation you see here where we have got a slightly dense nodule, not really obviously calcified, and we may need to do something else such as a CT scan, or as we'll see later in another talk, dual energy radiology can, uh, radiography can help clarify this issue. Um, Again, on CT, uh, dense central calcification, typical of a healed granuloma. I would just leave this kind of a lesion alone. This is probably a histoplasmoma. Often smooth margins, and certainly the calcification is very helpful. So the traditional criteria for malignancy are going to include complete absence of growth for two years and a benign pattern of calcification. Now, again, we know in the case of those very small lesions that they may grow very slightly over two years. And in the case of a small ground glass lesion, it may be difficult to be sure there's been absolutely no growth over two years. So we have to be a little bit cautious about this, especially if it's a high-risk patient, if it's a cigarette smoker, and if we're not certain that the technique is completely comparable. If we don't have, for instance, high-resolution sections on the at consecutive exams, we sometimes will choose to follow these lesions over longer periods of time. There's always an exception to the rule. Usually a lot of calcification in nodules means benignity. This is a patient with osteosarcoma. And of course, sarcoma metastases, as you see here, can calcify. All right, moving on uh, to some other kinds of lesions in the chest. Uh, slightly less common tumors. This is a patient in his 30s presenting with recurrent pneumonia, a typical pattern for left upper lobe atelectasis shown here. Atelectasis is shown on the CT scan with a partially calcified mass. This would be typical, of course, of a carcinoid lesion, very vascular, relatively slow-growing lesions. Here we've got a lesion with smoothly marginated with popcorn calcification, typical of a hamartoma. This is a CT scan of another hamartoma showing the fat that's characteristic and visible in approximately 50% of such lesions. Most hamartomas we see are smaller, such as here, with just little specks of fat, which one can pick up by measuring the Hounsfield units, and often little flecks of calcium as well. So usually in older males, rarely endobronchial, and again, high-resolution technique is going to be very important in those cases. Um, here's a, a different kind of a lesion. There's a clue in this vessel that's visible here. And, of course, this is an arteriovenous malformation, and it's the large draining vein that's usually visible. The lesion itself is often smoothly marginated. Another example picked up on CT scan, the uh, artery and draining vein shown here. The lesion itself uh, appearing as a little peripheral nodule 
and actually some additional uh, small AVMs. These are often multiple lesions, as you know. <coughs> uh, CT is certainly the technique of choice. This is a large AVM with a large draining vein that was picked up in a patient who uh, presented with an embolus to the kidney as a result of shunting. And uh, these are nice cases to take to the 3D workstation and do some reconstructions on. And uh, this is just one such example that allows us to show the lesion three-dimensionally because it enhances uh, so strongly. Of course, with contrast, it can easily be segmented out from the other structures. And this kind of a 3D rendition is often helpful to the surgeons who uh, want to treat it. So about a third of these are multiple. Many of them have the uh, hereditary telangiectasia syndrome, and they are more common in the lower lobes. Let's run through uh, the major cell types of lung cancer. Adeno is now the most common, and bronchoalveolar is a subset. Squamous cell used to be the most common. It's dropping somewhat in the ranking. Small cell, of course, is a very aggressive kind of cancer, about 15%. does usually respond well to chemotherapy, and large cell has, tends to have a relatively poor prognosis. Squamous is the one that typically cavitates, but they don't have to cavitate. But certainly, if you see a lesion like this, squamous cell CA would be the most likely possibility. I showed you this adeno. Adenos are the ones that typically occur in the periphery, grow slowly, most common in women, and they're sometimes associated with pulmonary fibrosis. Again, this is likely to be an adenocarcinoma, a part solid lesion with some ground glass opacity. Uh, actually, this was bronchoalveolar. <clears throat> and large cell tends to have a very poor prognosis, presenting as a large mass. You can sometimes suggest a diagnosis of small cell by virtue of seeing a small lesion or invisible lesion in the lung and a lot of mediastinal lymphadenopathy. It certainly can look like lymphoma, commonly associated with perineoplastic syndromes. And bronchoalveolar is the one that often causes a diagnostic dilemma because, like the case shown here, it can look like pneumonia. It can be an airspace opacity. It can have endobronchial spread. And it can have a lot of these fluffy, poorly defined nodules, such as you see here with sort of a non-solid characteristic. Um, I'm going to skip over dual energy chest x-ray because one of the additional talks I'll give this morning will encompass that. I'll just say a word about uh, CT contrast enhancement, which has been really pioneered at the Mayo Clinic by Steve Swenson and others. And uh, this is a technique to help distinguish benign from malignant nodules by looking at the temporal sequence of contrast enhancement. It does require meticulous technique. It does require high resolution. It requires sequential scanning over a period of several minutes. But it's been found that less than 15 Hounsfield units of enhancement is pretty specific for a benign lesion. Nearly all the cancers enhance. But, of course, if it does enhance, it doesn't mean it's a cancer. So it's not very specific. But it is helpful to um, rule out a certain number of small cancers. Most people don't do this. Um, and, in fact, we don't do it, um, perhaps because we haven't had all multi-detector scanners until now. And I think with the new multi-detector scanners, it would be a lot easier to reproducibly capture sequences at high resolution through small nodules. I'll just finish by showing you uh, this case, which sort of... Um, includes some of the issues that we've been talking about. A small lesion detected uh, recently on, in last December on this chest x-ray, a patient with previous surgery and radiation, a follow-up exam, a previous exam. <clears throat> and here we noted this uh, small nodule projected over the first costal cartilage, but you see it wasn't there before. There's nothing as helpful as having a previous radiograph. Here we have a close-up view. The projection actually is very similar, and there's a suggestion of speculation. So. In a patient with a known head and neck CA, this is as likely to be a primary as a metastasis. And here's a dual energy uh, exam, which I'll come back to, which takes the bones nicely out of the image, confirms this is not calcification in the costal cartilage. And uh, finally, a PET scan uh, obtained with our PET CT scanner, showing the lesion clearly here and lighting up like proverbial lighthouse on the CT scan, even though it's very small. So uh, you're going to be hearing a lot more about PET scans uh, later um, in this uh, course. Basically, uh, we, we have got issues with detecting and characterizing single nodules. Multiple nodules, as you know, if they're large, are likely to be metastases. 
less likely granulomas, rheumatoid nodules, Wegener's, or other. But the vast majority of cases with large non-calcified nodules in our practice will be metastases. Septic emboli can be poorly defined. They tend to evolve rapidly and cavitate. Opportunistic infection is a possibility if the patient is immunosuppressed. For instance, uh, opportunistic fungal infection can look very like this. Bronchoalveolar carcinoma can produce multiple poorly defined nodules. Primary pulmonary lymphoma is actually a little unusual, especially if there's no sign of lymphadenopathy. This case is none of the above. It's actually nomular sarcoidosis. Granulomatous disease is uh, something that can present as miliary nodules. This is a case of miliary TB. Miliary metastases, most typically in thyroid CA. Sarcoidosis, uh, inhalational disease, silicosis or berliosis, and of course Langerhans or eosinophilic granuloma. Uh, but this is an actual case of uh, miliary TB. And the last case I'll show you is, uh, just for differential, a solid airspace opacity in the right lower lobe. Could be pneumonia, but this is persistent, and this is a diagnostic dilemma. Uh, one should think first and foremost in this kind of a case in an older patient of bronchoalveolar carcinoma. This is exactly what it can look like. It can grow very slowly. It can even wax and wane over time. Primary lymphoma can look exactly the same, though it's less common. Then we can think of indolent infections and chronic organizing pneumonias, and many of these cases will eventually have to be resolved by biopsy.